Um, but that, um, I'm going to, I'd like to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Jeff Chapman. Uh, he's the MVP of technology and enterprise architecture and data science services at Capital One. Uh, he's going to talk about how to drive innovation at large organization. Without further ado, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, first of all, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, I love coming to Chicago. What a great city. And uh, you know, I work, I work at Capital One, as you heard. And uh, we've been working toward uh, a machine learning agenda for a while now. And I'm, I'm here to tell you the story. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to show you a video we made of an event similar to this that we had in uh, McLean, Virginia uh, of, in, in February. So go ahead and roll the video. <laughs> So um, yeah, we're, we're invested. And now the question Sri posed to me was, how did you overcome your, your fear of trying to drive such a difficult agenda? And we came up with this idea of, well, we had to figure out how to stop worrying and, and, and move forward. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very big deal. I'm sure a lot of you are facing big questions about how do you get there. We, we have a story that is about the steps that we took uh, you know, simplified, of course, because it's been multiple years. But I'm going to walk you through uh, that journey. Uh, hold on. I don't think I got that working, so let me just hit this. Okay. So 
So Sri wanted me to name this uh, talk, uh, Our Fear of Making Mistakes is Holding Us Back. I think that's a, that's a great idea to, to contemplate. And, and it really is a mystery as to what is going to happen around the corner. So, so I think while we're working through all the, all the aspects of machine learning and everything else, uh, big data related, what do we need to learn? It's important to recognize that uh, you, you are going to make mistakes. And let me go ahead and get started and, and show you what steps we took. So first off, defining your own strategy, I think, is, is important. I'm sure a lot of you have already thought about all the convergence that is going on uh, with hardware and software and cloud computing. And of course, uh, what is happening now with machine learning algorithms. And it's not just you know, supervised learning, but also unsupervised deep learning. And, and a lot of exciting things are happening that you'll learn more about today around ensemble models. So with, with this idea of saying, hey, we believe this, uh, the people driving change, that really better predictive applications are the outcome of all this, uh, we, we started um, making, making some major inroads. So the way we, we actually did that was uh, having not just a, OK, the end state is machine learning and better predictive applications. We actually had a broader, what we call data technology strategy, which was going to move us from our legacy environment uh, to ultimately an environment that you could create uh, better applications and, and build better models. And so we had to prove that it was going to go somewhere. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it's, it's a way in which you have to figure out how to tell that story in the context of how it drives biz better business results. So the first step was uh, proving that you could do it. So what, one of the things that you want to think about is where can I actually prove that something that's happening today, an internally built predictive model of some sort, uh, an, a user, or sorry, a vendor created uh, actual application that, that does some prediction, can you, can you actually prove that you can do it better than what is already there? I think this is a really good first step, and you have to commit to the idea that you're going to be doing a lot of things manually. I think H2O makes it easy with the tools that they have. I guess we've all got it on their laptops now. But acquiring the data, figuring out how to actually measure the results of what it is that's already exists today and how you're going to prove that what you're training and building is actually going to be better. I think the science of proving that you can horse race a, a new model is an important skill set that you're going to want to have moving forward. So it's not just, hey, i got to prove it for the business case, but every single new uh, machine learning mechanism, you're going to want to continue to prove that it's, it's getting better results and, and comparing it to existing models so you know where you're going to continue to invest and move things forward. So we, we ended up, uh, literally back in 2014, delivering our first uh, Cloudera-based data lake. And we created large uh, sandbox areas for people to acquire data and actually start trying through using many different mechanisms, Python, R. I'm sure you've experimented with a lot of things. And, and finding the way in which we could prove that the, the more data matters and that we could you know, beat our highly tuned mathematical models that we've been running the business off for, for, for years. And we were able to do that. It took uh, a good six months before we had meaningful results. And so what do you do after you've got the, uh, you can prove that you can do it? Uh, you want to persuade senior leadership uh, to, to buy into the overall concept. Uh, so we, we ended up <clears throat> having, having a number of teams trying it out. And we came up with at least a couple examples where we were actually getting better predictive results. And we, we felt like the senior leaders at Capital One were very quick to understand the implications of that. Because Capital One was founded on what we call our information-based strategy, which really from the beginning of the company was a way in which we were using analytics to provide better products. So the implications that there are going to be even better ways to do more predictive um, applications led to the, the very easily understood threat that there will be competition uh, coming at what, what is effectively the core competency of, of our company. And so that it inspired the, OK, this is a powerful set of technologies. If we don't invest in it, we will have competitors that will come along and start beating us in the market on what we do best. And so that um, insight into what is it that's possible and how is that going to help us remain competitive really led to the idea that we've got senior leadership buy-in. We're able to start moving forward. And of course, the notion of multiple teams and the excitement from what we're calling the grassroots level of hands-on data scientists and data engineers proving out that we can do these results really inspired confidence to uh, help get the kind of buy-in and funding for, for the initiatives uh, that we had. So getting, getting started, uh, we thought it wasn't going to take that long, but it definitely took longer than we thought. So 
first of all, laying the data foundation, as I'm calling it, uh, is, is difficult. The, the idea that you're going to change uh, your data environment so as to make data available um, and even data that you maybe didn't have before for, for not just you know, building models off of a data lake, but also um, a streaming data platform so you can actually be running these models in production, turned into uh, now a multi-year effort where, again, we started with our uh, data lake build uh, in the summer of 2014. So it's been almost two years, and we've, we've now got nearly three petabytes of data in our data lake. We built out a Kafka-based streaming data platform, uh, and along the way, not just uh, the Hadoop-based data lake, but also the Kafka stream data platform, we recognized that there's a lot of things that, for an enterprise, weren't there. Uh, things specifically around data management. So we've been building capabilities with Cloudera for um, data lineage, for, for even uh, integrated data quality checks, and all the things that lead to being able to run models in production. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me one second. As, as well as setting up the, the streaming data platform so as to have an actual uh, real-time way of feeding models with new data and executing them uh, in, in production. So you know, today we're running H2O inside of Spark uh, for a couple applications. But we didn't have those streaming data platforms before, so it took a while for us to set that up, as well as building even data management mechanisms for, um, for, for Kafka, including the same similar things, data, um, uh, data lineage, where, where is it coming from, as well as you know, quality checks along the way that we need to make sure as the data flows that we're, we're not ending up with um, a lack of uh, the best possible inputs into the, to what we're executing. So along the way, of course, the, the cloud has now become what we talk about every day. So we've been building on-prem, and now we're re-engineering to moving to the cloud. So, so there's probably a, a benefit if you haven't got so far as to build something on-prem yet. Going directly to the cloud is uh, something that we feel is a good idea. The capabilities there are, are pretty much meeting all of our requirements. That doesn't change the need for better data management, especially if you're a regulated entity. But we're re-engineering uh, some of our applications or building them for the first time uh, on the cloud. So uh, we're, we're working with AWS. We'll be working with Microsoft soon. And it definitely looks like Google has a lot of offerings uh, that, that we're going to want to take advantage of. So you'll see, you'll see the rapid pace of change uh, continue, if not accelerate, in, in terms of what's possible uh, running in the cloud. So beyond laying that data foundation, which, again, is not only difficult but expensive, um, you, you want to take a, an open source approach. We feel that open source is helpful in many ways. Uh, you certainly know uh, a lot of those ideas, making sure that you have access to the latest, greatest tools. The fact that um, contributing back to H2O, as an example, allows for their product offering to move more quickly. But we had to figure out how to do this the right way. So we created what we call our open source office, which is a uh, group of people that spend their time, um, they're within, within our enterprise architecture group, uh, figuring out the, the ways in which we can protect ourselves from an intellectual, intellectual property standpoint, that we can actually uh, make sure we're automating any kind of new data, uh, open source software consumption, that we're testing it for security, and making sure that we've got the right libraries and, and IP uh, protections that are required, as well as making sure that the licensing that um, comes with any given um, open source product that we want to consume and contribute back to doesn't present problems in the future. So definitely a great idea, but it's not as if it's something that you could just do uh, without, without some oversight. And so that open source approach is great because you, you get the collaboration. Um, we've even been building our own internal GitHub for all the applications we're building, including these machine learning applications, so people can see and understand how these systems are being built and contribute to those. But at the same time, making sure we, we protect uh, what, what isn't necessarily, uh, let's say, techniques or IP that we'd like to share outside. So what next? So exercising your, your data science muscles, I think, is really key. It's been now, as I've said, a couple years. We have continued, iter continued to iterate around what, what skills, what tools, and, and what roles do we need to fill. So we've moved more to an idea that the teams that are going to work on these solutions have multiple skills. So uh, certainly strong data scientists, but even some statisticians that, that know the math, uh, some data engineers, um, even 
uh, let's say, more specific um, infrastructure folks that know how to provision where these applications will run. So we consider that kind of outcome as exercising the muscle with all these different skills working together. Uh, we went so far as to hire a number of external experts, so they came into the company to help really explain uh, what's different and what's new, as well as built what we call our Big Data Academy, which is an entire set of curriculum that allows for everyone to understand like how do they get started. So very much curated and, and leading to uh, a number of outcomes that, that people can um, know what to build and how. And on an architectural front, uh, a commitment to APIs I think is important, where with a little bit less prediction about, okay, these particular services, whether they're um, a data provisioning services or, or scoring uh, model execution, building them via APIs allows for whatever applications come next that there will be consumption uh, uh, down the road with minimal rework. So for example, building our navigational tool for where is all the data uh, at Capital One. Uh, we started off with building a you know, in, inter-sourced tool internally, creating APIs that were accessing metadata repositories and helping you navigate and provide search to find what a data is where. And that was built just for our, our data lake, but we, because we've taken that API approach, uh, we've actually got our legacy environment now being plugged into it so you can navigate uh, and easily traverse all the data uh, within our environment. And we plan to go further than that and say, okay, uh, when it is the case that data needs to even be provisioned from existing environments to other areas, then you'll access those same APIs and start uh, moving the data where you need it to move. So you want to think about how that ecosystem is going to be built and you want to architect it the right way uh, moving forward because uh, you're not going to be able to continue to get the innovation of what's possible if there isn't ubiquitous access to all the data sets. Uh, and as much as people have permission to do that as well, you need to provide uh, some security around it. So what else have we discovered? We discovered that the actual UI is really important. Uh, from, from a data background, having the notion of, hey, I just need to get this batch job run, or I need to get this data provisioned, or I need to build this particular model, and that being iterative and kind of um, just something that, that wasn't really that glamorous relative to the, the interface. We're finding that as we start to roll out solutions to non-data scientists, but people that are working with tools uh, changing how they do their jobs. As an example, I'm going to talk about uh, what we're doing in the cybersecurity space. Well, if, if and, and the specific use case we're, we're driving toward is um, finding and, and managing our, uh, in, any inbound phishing emails, uh, this being a clear uh, threat that, yes, you can buy industry tools, but the idea of uh, building our own uh, set of machine learning algorithms will give us the ability to be even better at protecting our, uh, our inner uh, defenses there. And so the idea that we would build a, a entire environment where we could be streaming in the, the, the necessary data from emails that were coming to the company and then running some machine learning on it to figure out what it is it that we're looking for and then saying, okay, these are the alerts that are necessary for uh, people within our security incident center to do something about an attack, if you will, which they're you know, happening all the time. What is it that they're going to be looking at? They're not going to be running on the command line. They need an actual interface that helps them do their job quickly. And so we, we've, started to hire, uh, we've started to hire designers. Uh, we, we've got um, actual UI developers as well, adding to the mix that a full stack solution is necessary. And if not, then you, you effectively don't give that final mile for executing on a way to run your business more efficiently. So th this is a, an emerging area for us, uh, H2O has been very helpful and the, their UI designer, design team is uh, actually very good and continuing to help us figure out what's best uh, for what we're building. But it, you can't underemphasize the amount of effort that that's gonna take to really change um, how people do a lot of work inside. And of course, anything you may ever wanna present to cu customers about um, you know, data also needs to be a, a, an interface that's, that's rethought. So, what else did we learn? Okay, for, for this example, how do you get something into production as quickly as possible? The, the, the fact is, across many different domains, we, we've got some grand visions of, hey, we could do things better, smarter, um, and, and uh, more intelligently. 
and that's a big vision. How do you transition into something like uh, you know, minimal viable product that is as narrow as possible so that you can get an end-to-end -end solution delivered? Uh, it ends up being harder than it sounds when you're, when you're looking at something big and new. I've already talked about the infrastructure implications, but just the requirements themselves to get the, your business customers to agree like, hey, this is something we're gonna try out because this is a very valuable um, thing for us to get into production so that we know all the things we're gonna run into along the way. Uh, clearly, there's gonna be environmental concerns and security concerns and uh, in, in, in our case, model governance uh, concerns. So I, I thought, hey, you know, fine, we've got model governance for important things in, let's say, the area of credit and didn't think that there was gonna be a lot of need to do model governance around us uh, looking at and, and modeling our in inbound emails. Uh, and I was educated to the contrary, that this is an important set of activities that <clears throat> need to be completed before we really turn on our full stack solution associated with this uh, phishing email um, example. We now have an H2O model running in production that's taking production data, but we're not actually turning that interface on because we're still building out some of those model governance capabilities that we discovered along the way. Uh, so it's important that you try something all the way end to end so you learn what you don't know uh, as you go forward. <clears throat> also with getting something completely into production, you start to really build that confidence on top of the dream you've sold, right? So we, we've got our prototypes, we've got our examples of how better models make better business, uh, we've been investing heavily in all this infrastructure. Seeing something in production has a magical effect on, on everyone. And as soon as that's yet again something new that people see you've done, then, then the is it really all possible becomes yes, it, it, it absolutely is. And, and, and more investment will follow. So as we go, over communicating lessons learned uh, is incredibly important. So humbly sharing the mistakes you make I think that's uh, important. I think the idea that you create an environment that is open and about learning and making this something that is encouraging others to try out something new, I think this is important. Um, and then, of course, championing the work of others uh, goes, goes a long way. I think the <clears throat> environment that we, we had in the past was a little bit more focused on any, any, given, any given individual uh, team delivering their work and, and therefore they were celebrated. And shifting that mindset, again, kind of in, in, in an open source sensibility to this is a, a step in the larger direction for transforming ourselves to be a machine learning company. That I think goes a long way to, again, encourage a broader audience to start participating. And the investment has just begun. So as we're on this precipice of turning on our, our first application, uh, we realized that operationalizing uh, continuous improvement into our production models is gonna be a whole new craft that uh, we, we have yet to understand the amount of investment necessary to make that happen. There will be plenty of um, you know, ways in which we can measure how much more investment is there. I can't share that yet because we haven't uh, crossed that finish line, but the expectation is I think we're gonna have a multiplier on the amount of investment once you get a, a production model running that you need to now continue to retrain it, continue to invest, and then also uh, working toward changing the processes that are, you know, that, that particular model is supporting. So thinking about it as a changing how work is done is, is kind of at the core. And you get this kind of notion of, all right, well, now I'm going to re-engineer what people's jobs are so they can now focus on and leverage the tools. And I think as those things come online, there are gonna be a lot more input that comes in, not just for how, how does that model get more, more predictive, though that's important, it's also like what's that better interface, what's that better next idea that we can move toward. So I think there's gonna be uh, a big acceleration uh, moving forward as, as we get there. And um, setting the expectation that it takes a while, one for that model to get trained and get those results uh, repeatedly at a, at a better uh, uh, level of prediction, also takes time. So setting those expectations I think gives the, everyone the right sensibility about what it's gonna take <clears throat> when they're contemplating their, their project. So, so I'll, I'll wrap up with, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. I think the fact is we're, we're seeing a massive movement in the industry uh, toward uh, you know, leveraging machine learning in, in all ways. And the, there's uh, no harm 
uh, being concerned, and, and the answer to that is uh, dispelling your fears and, and learning what you can. So that's the end of my presentation.